Welcome back to our intermediate financial accounting class. Over our last few segments, we've been talking about the first two financial statements, the income statement and the statement of retained earnings. Now we get to turn our attention to the next two financial statements, the balance sheet and the statement of cash flows as part of our overall discussion or review of the accounting cycle. Now, the reason that we talk about the financial statements in this particular order is because this is the way that we do them when we're actually doing accounting. You see, once we finish doing our adjusting entries and doing an adjusted trial balance, then we use those numbers to make an income statement. Once I have my income statement, and particularly net income, I can use that number to calculate retained earnings in my statement of retained earnings. Remember, I'm gonna start with beginning retained earnings, add in net income, subtract dividends, and it's gonna give me what retained earnings will be at the end of this year once I've done my closing entries. It doesn't have that balance yet, but it will. Once I have the ending retained earning balance, then I can take that number and put it with my other permanent accounts in my balance sheet. And then once I have an income statement that gives me my beginning revenue and cost of goods sold and other expense numbers, and my net income number, and I have my dividends from a statement of retained earnings, and I have my balance sheet numbers, beginning and ending balances, I can use all of that information to create my statement of cash flows. You see, it's a very specific order. So specific and so important that it actually is one of our key concepts, which makes the discussion that we're about to get into even more important. Let's get started. Let's go ahead now and take a few minutes and talk specifically about the balance sheet and the statement of cash flows and why they're so important to investors. Now, as we talked about the income statement, we mentioned the fact that earnings per share and net income are probably the most important numbers in accounting. However, it's really a limited set of analyses that only uses earnings per share or net income. To really do a good job, we have to include the numbers on the balance sheet and the statement of cash flows as well to get a better picture of what's really going on in the business. So the information we're about to create, while not the most important number, provides an important context for that number so that we really can understand what's going on. This also provides us with the basis of a lot of other ratios and key indicators that we can look for as, as analysts. The other thing that's important about a balance sheet is that it provides us a running total of how we're doing. Whether we're making money for the investors as the assets grow and as their stake in those assets grow, or whether we're losing money or taking on too much debt, and that's kind of cutting out what our investors are going to get. The statement of cash flow, on the other hand, also provides useful information about the life cycle of the firm and where the firm is within that life cycle. Again, another really important idea. Once we're done with a balance sheet and a statement of cash flows, there's all sorts of ratios that investors and analysts can use to decide whether or not a company is doing well and to compare it with its uh, competitors and with its past performance. So we're not going to be able to talk about all of them. There's just too many to go through in any one uh, lecture, that's for sure. But we are going to talk about three of the most important. These are important financial statements. And again, if you can build them, you really understand them. And if you really understand them, then you can analyze and interpret them, whether you're an accountant explaining them to somebody else, or an investor or business manager trying to analyze your competitors or your own business to see how you've done. With that then, let's talk about the purposes of a balance sheet. The income statement and statement of retained earnings that we've already done, those are summarizing or adding up and showing the effects of all the transactions that have happened all period long, all the profit and withdrawals that we've made all period long, those are our two statements, the balance sheet isn't trying to summarize what's happened all year long. It's a snapshot, it really is, where we're saying right now, as of this moment, click, this is what our business looks like. I know that's kind of corny, but that's really what it is. So when you end the period, December 31, 2000, whatever year it is, that's what our business looked like. And we want to show specifically what the company owns, the assets, and who claims or can claim those assets. Here are the liabilities, and what of those assets have to go to the debt holders, and the rest is going to go to our equity holders. The second purpose is to provide information about liquidity, solvency, and financial flexibility. Now, liquidity means our ability to handle our short-term obligations, so the stuff just coming due. And a lot of people tend to give that kind of short shrift or, or really not pay a lot of attention to it. But if we can't handle our 
liquidity issues, we're not going to be around long enough to deal with anything else. So liquidity really is an important idea and an important uh, assessment that we need to make to decide if a company is doing well. Solvency, on the other hand, is our ability to handle our long-term obligations, primarily to debt holders. Can we pay off our bonds and our notes and our mortgage, etc., as it comes due? In addition, we kind of want to get a feel for whether or not we can pay our investors back something, our owners. Do we have the funds and the assets available to give them something back? Now, that's a part of solvency as well. The last one is financial flexibility, and often this one gets forgotten. But it's our ability to handle the unexpected that comes up in our business. Now, usually we tend to think about this one in terms of the negatives. What happens if there's a disaster, a fire, a flood, a tornado, etc.? Can we handle that? What if a bunch of debt gets called due all at once, or somebody wants to convert a bunch of debt into stock? Can we handle that? But the flip side is also true. What if we have this huge opportunity come up, and we need cash right away to be able to handle this investment or this opportunity? Do we have the resources that we could do it? So really, we want to make sure that we're comfortable with both the good and the bad with our financial flexibility. The final real purpose of the balance sheet is to help investors assess the riskiness of the business and allow them to predict future cash flows. On the one hand, assessing risk really is a tricky business. There's a lot involved with trying to decide if an asset's really going to be, a, or excuse me, if a business is really going to be a good investment. All sorts of analyses and ratios and, and comparisons that we want to make, and a lot of them come right from the balance sheet especially as we start looking at the debt of a company and if so much of its money or cash flows in the future are going to be tied up in making interest payments and debt payments. Finally, as far as predicting future cash flows, well, we get a lot of that from our statement of cash flows. I know this is the purpose of a balance sheet, but if you know how many assets we have and you know how we're using those assets and how we're turning those assets over, then you can get a feel for whether or not we're going to be able to turn those assets into cash. So those are our key purposes for our balance sheet. Now before we move on, I should mention that this is our second key concept in our discussion of the balance sheet, and that is the purposes. What is a balance sheet good for? So we want to make sure we're comfortable with this key idea. Now in addition to its purposes and why it's good, we also have to talk about its limitations. The first is the fact that we're using old historical values. In our balance sheet, we really do list all of our assets are what we originally paid for them, which means that if we're in an area where land is appreciated or equipment is appreciated or, or we've got a patent that, that is just exploded and people really need this wonder cure that we've created, tough. You don't get to show any of that. So that's a limitation is in that we're not showing the current values in our asset section particularly. Now the reason for that, again, is because we can't measure that. We don't know whether we've got good estimates or accurate estimates or if people are just coming up with numbers that make them look good. So it's hard to come up with current values unless you're actually selling the asset. And that's one of the reasons why we've stuck with these conservative records. Next, we're using a lot of estimates and judgments when we create the balance sheet. And we talked about this when we talked about the income statement as well. We have to. Right? I don't know how long that asset's going to last, so all of our accumulated depreciation depreciation expense is based on a guess, my best guess. Coming up with how much warranty expense or bad debt expense, not only are they based on my estimates, but they're based on the methods I use to calculate those final numbers based on those estimates. So those are a limitation because I just don't know for sure what the future is going to hold. It's a necessary limitation, but it's still a limitation. The final thing is that the balance sheet omits a lot of information that's important. Why? Because if we can't come up with a number, we don't even try to put it in the balance sheet. Instead, we just leave it out. So there's a lot of things that we don't include. The value of our employees, the value of some of our key assets. For example, think about the golden arches. And that's McDonald's. Even my, my little kids can recognize the McDonald's or the Walmart symbol as we drive by. That's worth a lot of money but none of that shows up on the balance sheet because there's no way to quantify what the golden arches are really worth. So we leave them out. The same thing holds true with the, with the people that we've invested in. Think about Warren Buffett or Bill Gates and what they're worth or what Steve Jobs was worth when he worked for Apple before he passed away. What was he worth in his, his skill? What was it worth? 
Now that gets recorded because we have no way to quantify the skill of these individuals. So things like that just get left out because we just don't have good estimates for them. So those are our limitations of our balance sheet. Again, not really that different from what we talked about with the income statement, but they're things that we need to know and be familiar with just so that we don't put too much stock into numbers that are of necessity estimates. The balance sheet has a couple of different formats. So there's two different options that you'll see. The first is what we call an account format. And in account format, this is the old style. We list all the assets on the left, and then we list the liabilities and equity on the right. So you get kind of a debit and credit picture, as well as assets equal liabilities plus equity. Now we've kind of gotten away from that because of SEC reporting. The SEC likes a different style. They like this report format. We just make one big long list of everything and then just keep the asset section separate from the liabilities and equity section. So the SEC forms or format is more of that report version and we've seen the account format kind of fall by the wayside because most people, even those who aren't publicly traded, are, are kind of shifting by default into this report format. But especially small companies will still use the other style. Now within either style, of course, we have three categories. The balance sheet really does follow that accounting equation. So we're going to have an asset section, a liability section, an equity section, and then we're going to check to make sure that the assets equal the liabilities and the equity. That's what we want to see in our balance sheet. Now those main categories notwithstanding, we don't usually just create this huge list of assets, liabilities, and equity. Instead we break it down so that we can organize it and provide a little more information to our investors. So here's just some of the different sections that you'll often see. Uh, usually we break down current assets and current liabilities as the assets and liabilities that we're going to use up or pay off within one year or operating period, whichever is longer. We see a long-term investments section, a PP&E section, an intangible assets section, other assets. I mean, you can read the list. But instead of going through and talking about each of these now, let's build a balance sheet. I think that'll be a lot better at showing what each of these segments mean. We've gone quite a while, so we're not going to try to build a balance sheet now. What we'll do instead is we'll wait, and we'll talk about it in our next segment. See you then.